Welcome to the Real Advisor Podcast, T-R-A-P, TRAP. Please follow us and join in the conversation on Twitter at Advisor Podcast, where you can suggest ideas and themes you'd like the TRAP team to discuss. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a six out of five star review on iTunes. Doing all this really, really helps us, which means we can do more to help you. Now let's head over to the studio for the latest pile of trap. Yes, indeed. Welcome back, dear Trappist, to episode 13 of the Real Advisor podcast, T-R-A-P Trap. My name is now Lick Ninken going forward, thanks to Abe and his mangling of the English language. Joining me as ever in the studio of Doom are the three other horsemen of the apocalypse, the so-called Trap Pack, Carl the Wodgemeister Widger, Hello. Alan the Storyteller Smith, and Andy Hart. Gentlemen, we have a show packed full of absolutely nothing, so let's on start to packing it straight away. Andy, mangle some reviews for us, my friend. Sure. Over to me for three juicy reviews. The first one is uh, from Esmec uh, in Ireland. Great listen, five stars, great insights and easy to listen to. Really enjoyed it and looking forward to the next episode. Next up is Patchy1000, six out of five star reviews, five star reviews, very insightful. And the slightly longer review is from Scooby D10, five stars, a trap worth falling into. I expected nothing less from these advisors with an E, but loving the relaxed format and chatting through shared thoughts and ideas could only be bettered if i was in a pub with them with a beer or three and i was there to join in but for now this does nicely appreciate you all giving up your time to give back that's it over to you nick superb thanks guys and girls for the reviews keep them coming in it does give us a little flip and a shot in the arm so just some topical tidbits to give this episode a time stamp for our trappist audience i see that the personal finance society has now spent eight hundred thousand pounds on third-party legal and audit costs in its clash with the uh, Chartered Insurance Institute, its bigger brother or its effect parent. That sounds like an awful lot of money, and I just can't see this being resolved in any way where where, where there's going to be trust or satisfaction on either side. That's an awful lot of money. Don't you think that when you you hear these figures getting quoted, it's just insane. The best part of a million pounds for some legal advice. Now, this this is... Look, I know it's it's kind of a big issue, but really in the greater scheme of things, it's a bit of a storm in a teacup, a sort of interprofessional dispute, £800,000. It reminds me, you know when you hear of like, the regulator um, getting a, a new logo and it costs like £4.5 or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you must, you, the ideal job is to be a, a lawyer who gets appointed or a sort of a brand logo designer for a big corporate and just charge millions because those figures are just off the scale. Nuts. Yeah, yeah, and it's worth remi- remembering that the PFS people certainly don't get paid for their the roles they're doing and 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 everything they're going through. So they've got the pressure of this battle with the CII, and then the pressure of knowing they're spending members' funds at this rate, but they're not getting paid for all this time they're putting in. So it's just it seems to me like an immense mental drain and obviously a financial drain. Um, in other news, uh, a firm in the southwest of um, uh, England. Um, called Nexus, has run into problems. It looks like there's been some nefarious activities going on. We can't say the person's name. However, there's one director at this firm, and in the news reporting so far, the FCA are after this one director. Um, Suffice to say that this one person (laughs) appeared to be one of these award junkies and won awards left, right, and center. And I think awards probably have a place, but I also think it's, it's a lot of it is projection. And people that enter awards for their own sake and routinely enter awards, it's like, okay, what what, what are you trying to prove? And um, uh, anyway, the, the thing about the, the one upside of the story is that it happens so infrequently that when it does, it's big news. But nevertheless, it does tarnish all of us, and that includes you, Carl, um, all of us advisors who are trusted with client monies. Um, it, it Definitely, Carl. Really it, it's, well. it's, it's alleged in newspaper reports that there's been some um, misappropriation of client funds, it would appear. This yes. obviously hasn't gone to yes, via, legal via process the platforms. Via platforms. Yeah. yeah. And the platform names are in the public domain. They are Nucleus and uh, and, and 7IM, apparently. Um, so it so just we'll, seems to me like uh, you're basically in turmoil over there, boys. So <laughs> you probably need to it's, get a decent a decent regulator like we have here. It's it's a sinking ship. And our, our, our MPs, our cabinet ministers, our evil, evil, tyrannical bosses, um, you know, the, the civil servants are breaking down because Dominic Rabb, stares at them 
That's one of the charges leveled against him. And they don't answer the questions he poses to them. And these are all microaggressions. We need we need some beefing up over this side of the uh, Irish Sea car. Interestingly, though, um, over here in Ireland, um, we as intermediaries never actually get hold of the client's money. So it's it's. It, I was a little bit taken aback that actually- we're the same. We're, no, no, we're the same, fellow. What what happened here was that this this person allegedly was taking was putting through unauthorized advisor fees from the client's investments on the platforms. We're, we're not allowed to hold client monies. It's, that's definitely, that's, that's arms. That you just don't do it. Well, yeah, general insurance discretionary is permissions. Yeah. Okay. Which, yeah there aren't any of those have, have. But, but, but yeah, which, we're, which we're we don't either. But I, I suppose the, the, I, I read some of the articles that you boys shared and um, there's a lot of money gone AWOL here, it seems. And, um, and I believe from what I've read, that um, it was found out because the platform said, whoa, what's going on here? But did it well, not When, when you've got the- advisor fees running into millions of pounds, it's not surprising that there's, there's some yeah, uh, tens warning of light flashes uh, on, a, on a platform. Yeah, but that's my point, Alan, that, that apparently this was over a two-year period. So yeah. um, I don't know. Are there not um, red flags going up somewhere um, if, there's, yeah. if there's large chunks of fees. Anyway, I'm sure this one will play out and I don't mm. think it's, uh, it's, it's, as Nick says, it's, it does affect us all because it's, you know, it, it's damaging the reputation of all financial planners um, and there's always going to be a few bad eggs, unfortunately. We all know that. Yeah. We just got to keep doing what we're doing and I suppose our big focus here is to, you know, make sure that the corporate governance has spoken about it. I've spoken about it so much. Make sure it's, you know, absolutely as rock solid as it possibly can be. Absolutely. Um, so I have um, another group of um, financial advisors that I'm friendly with, not as friendly as I am with you guys, obviously, but I have another group of IFAs that I occasionally socialize with. And I, and I, last week I spoke to them about the fact that I'm just looking at VCTs, Venture Capital Trust. And again, Carl, forgive me, I'm not sure if you have a, an equivalent in, in Ireland, but, but, you know, VCTs are where the, the British government is dead keen on, on, um, startup British companies, micro companies getting investment funds to help them lift off the ground. And if you invest in these companies, you get these tax reliefs up front. And, and a VCT is where a fund manager, God help me, invests in a range of these small micro businesses, aim listed businesses. So, you, you know, you have to pick the VCT. And it's, it's like going back to being an active fund manager, but on the selector, but on, on steroids, because you really don't know anything about any of these startups. It's like throwing darts <laughs> at board. But I put a bit of money into a couple of VCTs. Um, and you get 30% knocked off your tax bill as a result. And I mentioned this to one of these IFA friends that I was with. And, uh, you know, and, and one of them said to me quite aggressively, and I could see why he was being there. He said, well, okay, that's great. And you recommend these for your clients, do you, Nick, as, as likewise? And I said, no, I don't actually. I don't recommend VCTs. I know as part of my the, the, the retail package products, VCTs are in that category. And we're duty bound to raise them with clients when it's appropriate. And I do raise VCTs with clients, but I, w- I never go as far as to actually – researching and recommending one because it's just too many moving parts so i flag the fact that vcts are out there for clients that have got substantial tax bills do your own research if you want to because it's just it's i mean the clients are going to forget about the 30 percent tax relief they're going to forget that you're locked in for five years they're going to forget that these things are highly illiquid and you're you know you're a loss of permanent capital being wiped out there's a that they're very illiquid clients will forget all of this and also i've got i haven't got the skills to um to research the underlying vct to any great proficiency but the thing uh, that yeah. got me this this one of these ifas i was talking to he was saying he's got on his pi the excess for standard stuff is about 2k for pension switching it's about 5k for vcts the excess is fifteen thousand quid uh, unless i'm charging fifteen thousand quid for each bit of advice i give on a vct there's no, there's no way I can touch them as a businessman. So although the FCA might say you need to address these, and I do generically, there's no way I'm ever getting into a product recommendation on VCTs. It's just there's just no upside for anybody. Um, so it's just interesting to see how other people. I don't know if you guys have ever used VCTs through the advised side of your lives. Uh, we, I mean, maybe in all the years, I think one or two for very, very specific reasons. And this is assuming that your client is maxed out on every other legit tax wrapper, pensions, ISAs, even looking at kind of offshore bond wrappers as being a legitimate place to hold certain assets uh, only then. And so uh, once or twice, we actually had a piece of work done for us a few years ago, um, which was a, it's very difficult to get independent analysis 
on this stuff. But there is some published information. EIS, forget about it, a sort of one company at a time. But VCTs, there is some published information on it. And the report which we had commissioned, the, the upshot of it was that if it wasn't for the tax break, you, you're losing money on these things. With the tax break, you're just about breaking even. But the other thing to recognize is because it, it's very – it's very kind of labor intensive. You've got to do individual research and individual micro companies. All that is, you know, super expensive. So your your fees and costs are enormous. You 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 still it's sort of got, like going back to ten or twenty years. You've got five or six percent initial spreads when you set the thing up. You've got ongoing fees of best part of three percent if you look at all the yeah. added costs. You, you you know you've got a huge hurdle rate, and yeah, the tax relief helps. But the conclusion we came to, and it was you know, pretty much evidence-based and research-based, was you're better off just forgoing the tax rate, ta- tax break, and just investing in the public markets in a tr- more traditional way. You know, easy access, liquidity, super low costs. All right, you're not getting the same degree of tax breaks, but overall, all things considered, not couldn't come up with a very you know compulsive reason to recommend these in any sort of scale, as as opposed to the the occasional, the very rare set of circumstances that will happen you know, once every few years. What are your thoughts, Andrew? Well, I sort of concur what Nick said. Um, yeah, we've got to consider them for certain clients. I know some advisors are dead keen on them and there are companies that do a lot of the research for you, but um, yeah, I still avoid advising on them. High-end vanilla firm, I don't want anything blowing up. I want to sleep well at night. And yeah. you're right, Alan. We spoke about this before. Some of these sort of tax-led investments, um, maintaining the capital value but saving tax on the back end, you're better off just investing in standard investments and, and getting the market returns, which over time are you know, uh, are fabulous. So, yeah, that's my thoughts. Is that what you refer to yourself as, high-end vanilla? Quite like that. High-end vanilla firm. Yeah. Good. Good one. You can use plain that one, Very good. Very good. And the, 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 the portal high I use vanilla, for… High-end vanilla, not plain. The, the, high, the, the portal I use for VCTs is, 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 and this is not advice, by the way, this is it's an execution-only discount online brokerage is called Wealth Plan, And it's really slick. And Andy, although you're not interested in these products, you'd love the way they make this so easy to invest in VCTs, which are more of a pain in the ass than, you know, you've got to tick high net worth declarations, sophisticated. And, and I found out that Wealth Plan is owned by an ex-Hargreaves Lansdowne uh, director. So he's taken that approach of let's make this really client-friendly, yep. easy to use um, and it's seamless kind of end-to-end thing. So anyway, and Carl, just to close on the visa, do you, do you have a similar similar kind of structures in, in, in Ireland? I don't think so. Um, we have EIAS, which is uh, more like what Alan described, you know, investing in one company at a time. But there is kind of um, uh, a couple of places who are doing kind of EIAS funds. So there's several different businesses involved. We don't recommend them. <clears throat> A little bit like what you're saying, we're, we're aware that some of our clients go and do them. Uh, but look, it's, it's, it's startup companies, so it's, it's <laughs> mega high risk stuff. It's not what we do. Um, so, you know, we stick to our knitting. We know what we're good at. And that's definitely not something that, that we will be looking at anytime soon okay, or ever, I would say. Interesting. Well, Wealth Plan do VCTs, EISs, and then Seed Enterprise investment schemes the real mega ones you know so i'm just dabbling with vcts but uh, yeah it's, so are you, it's like, uh, whoa this is this are you, are you a serial investor now nick am i ser- <laughs> you claim to be an angel investor <laughs> serial oh god i don't i don't know on your, don't, your, your twitter I'm bio ten, change I'm your twitter profile x, i'm definitely 10x the serial investor i was this time last month um <laughs> let's move on now someone's putting that in the topical tidbit section value for money statements i think again that's hargreaves lansdowne i don't know who put that in there whoever I put, it was i put i, I put it in okay just something that came up it is topical it was well the, the the things themselves are not topical they've been out for a few years but they, the one i just happened to notice again this is uk centric not sure if your regulator insists on this carl but there's a there's a concept called all fund managers asset managers have to create this thing called a value a value assessment so they've got to look at bullshit and the, they've all got a you know they appoint a board and this this they, they effectively are told to mark their own homework you know is this fund is this range of funds is it value for money to is the consumer value? and I, yeah, it happens to be Hargreaves Lansdowne one that I saw you, I could have chosen anyone frankly but, but, um, but they were the one that came up but, last week but no, I just, I just saw this one. Just, just not quote, value, Alan. To, uh, sorry, not one Again? fund has said we're not value. Every single fund no, no. claims to but, be of value. So the Hargreaves Lansdowne. I'm not, I'm not singling them out. 
It just happens to be special situations fund over five years, they return 21.49%. Sector average, that's the sector of all other active funds, 54.21. So 21% versus 54. The strategic assets fund over three years, Hargis land down 4.99. The sector, 12.37. And over five years, uh, Hargis land's down 9.65. Sector average, 26%. So they're generally underperforming by about two thirds. You know, the, the sector was doing sort of two to three times over the exactly the same period in the same sector, the return. So they all sit around and say, right, boys and girls, is this value for money to our consumers, our customers? Yep. Of course Absolutely it is, yeah. tick the box. Now, I Sign know off. there's more than one thing in performance, but really, to an investor, what counts for more than the actual returns on my assets and my investments that you're giving me? So the whole thing, and it just concerns me when you think about it, without dragging back the consumer duty and all the regulations that we've got, and we go back a few years to treating customers fairly and not providing any barriers to exit if someone wants to change their mind, and big providers have still got exit penalties – I just honestly, I scratch my head. I get frustrated. I see these things. And you, the, can you imagine the, the amount of millions of pounds spent on introducing this legislation? And the, yeah. they all sit around, tick the box and say, yeah, yeah, we're fine. Great value for money. We're underperforming our sector by 60%. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a joke. Can't make it up. Couldn't make yeah, it up. I, th- I think we, we don't have that particular regulation in here, thank God. But I, I, I think we touched on this before, guys, that, you know, regulation is good overall. But regulatory uh, frameworks that are open to marketing spin, which is effectively yeah. what, for what this is, that's just not fit for purpose. And that's someone thinking something up one day on a Monday morning saying, oh, yeah, we should bring that in. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll roll it out to the fund management industry. You, you know, the biggest uh, thing, well, two, two big, biggest things that determine a lot of it. One is incentives. Where's the incentive to mark this down saying this is not value for money? And the other is... Um, is accountability. What happened? What happens to anyone who says this is good value, and someone else says, "Well, I don't think it is." How can you return, you know, four point four percent versus twelve percent, and say this is good value? There's no <laughs> consequences. It would seem to me, anyway. I don't know unless I've, I've, there's other yeah. things yet to happen in, in in the works that have yet to you know come to fruition. It's, isn't, right it, now, isn't it? Isn't it a little bit, Alan, like um, ESG funds that you know? Okay, there's yeah. there's frameworks and guidance coming in now as to what yeah. what makes something Article Nine or Article Eight or Article Six and all that kind of stuff. Whereas heretofore it was just yeah, we've decided it's ESG ready, so we're going to stick the ESG stamp on the front of the brochure. Yeah, you exactly. Know, so again, marketing spin. Well, we're here boys as the kind of the barrier to all this stuff we're going to shine a spotlight on these things um disinfectant is the best detergent it is it is sunlight lift up the rock and look underneath it and then watch the little beetles scurrying away but enough about little beetles um we had a we had a trappist get together recently at the the royal oak pub in marylebone to watch the first Saturday of the Six Nations I can't remember who Woo-hoo! was playing who, who won it's kind how of is that really. whole tournament going um, but we had to spend a few moments talking about that. We, we, had, we, uh, we had a couple of visits Lancer, from our beloved. We, were, we, we had a, a really good turnout of uh, Trappists. Uh, we were overrun, but there were two people who, who especially stood out. Um, so I'm here in a pub with uh, the uh, wonderful Ben Cordner, one of the big Trappist fans. Ben, you're a big fan of the show. What have you got to say about it? Uh, love the show. I have to say it's probably the least worst option out of all of the Financial Advisor podcasts oh. out there. The least worst. That's not what we agreed to say. I paid you money for something. I'm stopping this right now. And also, we were joined by a, a, a very fresh-faced young man uh, by the name of uh, Tom Sims. So I'm here with Tom Sims from First Wealth, one of the one of the best practices in London, probably the best practice in London. Some would say, maybe not Alan Smith. Tom is new to our profession. Tom, you're, you're listening to the Real Advisor podcast. Be honest about it. What do you think? Oh, it's great. As someone new to the profession, it's great to hear about people who've got so much experience, really, just telling people, you know, the ins and outs and what they truly think. There's no no BS. And yeah, it's great. And I love it. And yeah, it's probably the best, the best advisor podcast I've listened to so far, for sure. OK, well, we'll, we'll take out the probably. <laughs> Tom, you're on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? It's uh, Tom Sims. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. I, can I just jump in there? I, I've had to block Tom, unfortunately, on Twitter because he tweeted out that it was fantastic to meet you all and you're all total gentlemen. Tom, I wasn't there. 
I think that's why it was fantastic, Carl. Think, um, just so Tom Sims, he's another one of these poor sods with a, with a surname that's a car crash. So if you want to find him on Twitter, he's <laughs> at Tom Sims. It's spelled S Sierra Yankee, mother Sierra Sierra. I mean, that's just abysmal. Um, ben Cordner is, as you say it. So you can find both those guys on on Twitter. And they were, we, we were, there were so many Trappists there. We run a very highly organized competition. And it was Ben and Tom, out of all the hundreds that were there, that won a couple of uh, some, some trap swag. They went Great there. event. Beautiful. Loved Great it. Event. And Great the event. rugby Loves. match. What a match. I mean, that... Um... Yeah, I think we could talk about that, but let's move on to. The, I think time is the time is flying by. As we say, no, it was great, and then uh, obviously uh, Scotland were well worth it. Scotland have been well worth both their victories, as have Ireland, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's shaping up to be a great tournament. So all the games so far have had something. Uh, Scotland I think the and Ireland is going to be big. The ones who are just thinking, why, what, what this, this we're is doing not here? Really good for yeah. us in any in any. But shape at, le- or form. at least they're a top seed for the World Cup later this year. The Welsh, can you believe that? Top seed. Well, I know. Well, the seeding has to be done at some stage. I know. It does seem now. It seems uh, and nuts. in the um, quarterfinals... They're number one seed, Alan. Um, wow. Not number one. There's a, there's, a, there's a group of number... They're all seeded in different... One, two, three, four. Scotland, a third level. We've got Ireland and South Africa in our group. Yeah, and well, in the other group, then, is um, France and New Zealand. So yeah. um, two of Ireland, South Africa... New Zealand, France, and Scotland. Only two can go through. Mm. So it's a... Uh, D- gives England, history, uh, gives England uh, the usual easy route through. Yeah. Uh, to the quarters England, before they get bumped England, out. England and Australia, yeah. It, we'll yeah, walk totally into another final them, as usual. Um, as usual. Yeah. We usual shall get there. see, Andrew. We shall see. We're not Lincoln, putting up any Lincoln any hovers over the Johnny Wilkerson drop goal tweets. drop. No, I don't do it. Wow. Don't do it. I, 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 even you aren't confident enough to put that one up there now. No. Well, oh, no, we, no, we are going to win the World Cup, and you heard it here first. Right. Mm. Um, <laughs> but Nick, we'll, do, we'll, do that, we'll do that again uh, maybe next year. We'll have another event, and we'll get Carl to attend the next one, another trap get-together. I yeah, maybe, 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 maybe a, 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 a bigger venue, because we were, we, as I say, we were so yeah. overrun with Trappists. <sighs> Right, um, let's move on to the meat and potatoes, gentlemen. And Carl, you're going to talk to us about many things, about the third act, about physical and mental fitness. My friend, the floor is yours. Thank you, yeah. Um, I, we, we touched on this before, guys, um, and we're planning our second version of our Future You event, so it's kind of fresh in my mind, and, and we're trying to create the agenda for the couple of days and all of that kind of stuff, and it's come up in a couple of client meetings recently um, whereby we've people who are selling businesses and are retiring and maybe passing business on or whatever. And um, a couple of times, despite our, our best efforts along the way, you know, when you ask what, what are the plans, the client doesn't know, you know, and I, and I think it's, it's um, so, so important if we want to do real financial planning, which of course all of us do, um, to be addressing these issues with our clients well in advance of that selling the business moment or retirement moment. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the, broadly speaking, I, I think we need to be talking about a, a number of different pillars, you know, mental fitness. So making sure that, you know, you're, you're in a really good place because a lot of people have a kind of their, their sense of identity is linked to their their role, their profession, their job, their business, whatever that might be. And when it's gone, it's gone. And you might have a big bank balance afterwards, but a big bank balance afterwards isn't um, much use to you if you don't know what your purpose is going to be once you've gone through that transaction, shall we say. Um, and I think work um, around, and I think it's really important that, that that couples do this together, work around what your values are, what's important to you and you know, we can all talk about bucket list items and goals and dreams and aspirations, and we do, of course. Um, but we really need to start drilling in, I think, as real financial planners into those things well in advance of someone coming to that date. And, and you know, a lot of our clients are coming in, they're talking, they're, they're very focused on the finances. And, and yeah, loosely, you might be saying, um, yeah, you know, real wealth is going to allow me do the things that I want to do with the people that I want to do it with and when I want to do it. But it's to actually talk about, that's a lovely statement to make, but give us details. What does it look like? And start to talk about that. 
Um, and, and maybe it's, you know, up, upskilling or reskilling. So, you know, are you going to maybe, I have a couple of clients who have gone through this process and they've become kind of coaches. So life coaches, mentors, whatever, and absolutely loving it. And they're not doing it because they have to do it. They're doing it because they want to do it. And it's just something that I thought, you know, was worth kind of bringing up. Um, we are the Real Advisor podcast, so it's real financial planning. And it's it's so, so important. And, you know, even when we were talking about the, the stuff earlier on about um, different tax write-offs or products or what, you know, they, they, that's not what we're about. Um, so maybe, Alan, I, I know your um, podcast is the bulletproof entrepreneur and i've listened to all of the episodes and i find them really really good and i know you've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs who've kind of been through the process and out the other side so what's your take on this have have you kind of insights from the interviews that you've done in terms of you know what people should be looking at or, or what the experience was for, for entrepreneurs yeah i think it's a great subject I think it's really relevant. What's up with uh, Andrew? No, no, no story. But no, I mean, this was this was the uh, honestly, this was the thought process behind me even launching that podcast. Because if I go back over the years, I've been involved, I've been sitting in um, many's a you know a meeting room with uh, you know, often a business owner. Sometimes people build a business and sell it and then carry on working. Sometimes they go through retirement, but whatever you do, there's a transition. And so I was really on a personal basis. I was fascinated by the human journey. That people would, would go on the fin- the financials are the fin- are the financials, aren't they? You know, you, you do your modelling, you, you make sure you're tax efficient and reliable, and you know assets are allocated in their in the correct ways, and you get organised. But there's human beings in the story. There's often there's people and couples and partners and children, and sometimes grandchildren, and there's a, there's a really complex dynamic and set of circumstances. And I, I for one just find it just really really interesting. Hence launching this podcast last year. And reflecting back on it, you know, so I've done what twenty, twenty one, twenty two episodes now. Um, I mean, and some really stand out for me, particularly on this subject, Carl. There's there's one, um, I can't remember episode five or six, a guy called Mike Ames. And and Mike um, was a very successful, he was in the recruitment industry, built a business kind of from scratch, scaled it up significantly, and sold it for, you know. A, a very significant amount of money, life-changing amount of money such that he never needed to work again. He was in his 40s at the time, sold his business. And and as he says, he, and, and what's fascinating about this these podcast interviews is people are very, t- t- to my um, experience, kind of surprisingly candid. They really sort of bear their soul. And Mike did particularly, because Mike talked about going to a you know a very dark place. He said, sold, sold my business, had all the money I would ever need for the rest of my life. And yet almost could have, couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And, it, and a lot of it was about identity. It was about purpose. Um, he, again, openly shares on the, on the conversation. He had, to, um, he had to have therapy. He had to have people sort of coaching him and working with him. And, of course, everyone else would think, oh, you know, I wish I had your problems. You know, you're a multimillionaire. You know, big deal. You know, I, I bring out the smallest violin in the world to, um, you know, to, to play for you. But, you know, as they say, this shit is real. And he really, really struggled. I mean, he, he talks about, you know, the things that are, you talk about identity, but it's also activity. If you've literally got nothing to do every day, mm. it, it's, it's almost kind of comical in a way because he said, I had to spread out my activities across the week. So I didn't have much to do. A friend had phoned me up and say, um, do you want to play golf on Friday? He said, no, no, I'm getting my hair cut on Friday. How about, how about golf on Tuesday? Because they didn't want to do two things in the same day. <laughs> Little things like that were uh, you know, quite a, kind of comical, but nevertheless quite in, in, important. And in fact, um, the conversation I've just had is a lady uh, in the US called Denise Logan. And she's got a very interesting background. She's the latest episode that we just went live last week. She is a, she, her original background is from a mental health background. And then she... Pol- Grab yourself a drink, a very long drink. It's story time with Alan Smith. Not for the first time in your life, you're rather premature, Nick. Oh, um, I know. Cool. Um, I've got a story later. This isn't a story. This is just sharing um, the conversation I had with Denise last week. He was, you know, mental health uh, professional, qualified as a lawyer, built a law firm. 
sold that law firm in very tricky circumstances, did not make a success of it. Um, and she now, she, um, she's got a book um, called The Seller's Journey. And she really unpacks this whole thing and, and loads and loads of experiences. She coaches business owners, particularly, and those going through life transitions. And it's just so interesting. You know, she's made an entire career out of this very complex, difficult set of circumstances. And, and as you say, it's, it's not just about selling a business. There's life transitions, aren't there? It, it could be um, a retirement. It could be a divorce. It could be uh, um, someone passing away. There's a number of just life experiences. Kind of, we are very much, you know, at the forefront. If we're doing our jobs properly, we are the, you know, in the, what I call the in, inside the family's inner circle of trust. You know, we, things are being shared with us that aren't being shared with the accountant, with the lawyer, with a lot of other people. And I sometimes say, you know, if there's a bereavement in the family, sadly, we're the, we're the first phone call after the family, after, you know, the, the, the children or anyone else has been contacted, who should we call next? We'll call our financial planner because they know. They know the, the kind of the financial parts, you know, the legal parts, but they also know the family sort of circumstances. So it's, uh, it's an interesting place to be. What about you guys? Any thoughts on this kind of... This this third act, the, the and then life transitions. What are your thoughts? Mate? I, I, I'll just throw in the bit about how, how, and I think we have talked about this previously, and that's okay because these themes that we talk about are evergreen, and mm. we talk about them repeatedly because we believe in them and we live them. The burden that we carry as financial planners, and again, I don't want the smallest vial in the world. Okay, we love our work and we're well paid for it. It gives us a fantastic lifestyle. However, we carry a lot on our shoulders, uh, figuratively, uh, and as Alan said. Clients share stuff with us. They would never share with their accountants. They would never share with their solicitors, but they'll share them with us. And and at these significant life events, you know, this this the theme today of, of, of what do you do when you've sold and you've got this great big lump sum of money. Firstly, you've got a human being who now is thinking, I don't want to play golf on a Friday because I just want to get my hair cut. That's how desperately barren my diary is. Um, but also they've given you, they've given you their hard work in the form of this lump sum of money. Their, their three decades worth of hard work is now yours don't screw this up, Alan, Carl, Andy, Nick. Don't screw this up. And and so I, if, if you imagine like a Venn diagram, one circle is the solicitor, one circle is the accountant, and one circle is the advisor. But we are the only one who overlaps. And we, we know the client's finances. The accountant knows that. Great. We know the client's legal situation and their estate planning. The, the solicitor's done that. But the solicitor won't know anything else. We know their finances, their estate planning, and then we also know their 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 cash flow, their money fears, their family situation around money, all the other kind of stuff. And so we are we, we carry a lot. And I think sometimes we just underestimate how much we carry because we have jobs that we enjoy on the on the, on the upside. But there's definitely a subconscious part toll that it takes on our energy levels. I don't know if uh, Andy you want to talk about that before handing back to Carl. Yeah, I think the key word there is transitions and uh, Alan sort of spoke about it at length. Um yeah, clients go through various transitions and sometimes they overlap. Um, we're speaking about clients selling a business and having a lump sum of money, but I think I do my best work with clients on the approach to retirement, you know, 10 years away from it, you know, usually in their 50s, they've got usually 120 months left to potentially fix the problem. And, you know, they've got expensive questions. Am I going to be okay? Am I saving enough? You know, is the money going to last? I'm a big fan of the three questions that Mitch Anthony talks to with clients, I'll just very quickly go through them now. So the first question is, have you had enough? And it's generally just a, a, a question around their work and business. Have you had enough of going into the office or doing whatever it is you do? So have you had enough? That's the first question. People usually answer that you know, pretty, pretty definitively. The next question is, have you got enough? And that's a financial question. You know, Have you got enough? Will the money outlast you? That's the key next question. They obviously then say, that's what I hope you're going to help me out with. And then the third question is, do you have enough to do? Which, again, we've uh, touched upon today. And that's usually the one that sort of hits them the hardest. And they think, yeah, my identity is going to be lost. You know, Friday, I've got sort of responsibility. Um, you know, I'm looking after teams and, you know, I've, I've got an important role or whatever. And on Monday, I can't get the plumber to turn up, you know. Uh, you know, their, their identity has gone. So that's the thing that they fear the most, I think. Um, over to you, Carl. Yeah, look, I think all t- t- like that. That's great stuff. I, I, I do think Nick, just on your your point about the, you know, that we do have a we carry a burden or whatever. I, I I'm I, I get it that it's very serious the role that we play, um, very important, um, and that people do lean on us. However, if you're really into real financial planning, um, th- that's what I get my buzz out of. I suppose is what I'm trying to say, right? It's to have a real impact on people's lives. 
So therefore, it doesn't almost feel like a burden, albeit it is really important. But but if I can if I can maybe um, elaborate on that point or, or 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 kind of pull that thread a small bit, it's incumbent on us, therefore, to make sure that we are looking after ourselves and the people around us, right? In terms of the teams that are working with us, and you can only do your best work, and you can only have a deep impact on your clients and your your the families that you look after if you're actually in a good place yourself. And I think um, I'm kind of, this is springing to mind that um, I, I think it was the first time I met all of you boys, actually. It was a Humans Under Management, Andy, uh, 2018. And Alan Smith's um, uh, talk was, I think, Advisors Under Management, so a play on the AUM um, mm. uh, letters. So um, the reason I'm saying this is, is all well and good, you know, to, to, talking about all these things, but you need to look after yourself. I wrote a blog actually earlier this year, um, and it was um, it was a pointed blog because I wrote the blog to myself, and it was like I, I I published this blog as a promise to myself, and the blog, which I think we'll put in the show notes, Nick, um, was called "Put on Your Own Oxygen Mask First. Um, and that's something I've been really really poor at, even though I know these things. Um, I, I'm just about to renew my passport, 2023. You boys have seen the picture of my passport from 2013, which are the few years after I set up my business. And I look at that person grossly overweight and just, there is nothing good about, yeah, exactly. There is nothing good about that picture. Um, <laughs> oh, you look cuddly. It's a nice picture. Don't be down on yourself. No, I don't. I'd be. I'm very glad that I'm <laughs> renewing my, that, that. That one is going to be Probably, consigned to history. I think the word is, yeah. But um, but last year, I look. I'll be honest enough to say, last year, around this time last year, I ha- actually had to step away for a couple of weeks. Right, I had to say, guys, I'm just not coping with everything that's coming at me in terms of my business, my personal life, everything that's coming at me. I had to step away. I had great people around me that I was able to be. I was nervous actually even saying that, right? And it was only for a couple of weeks. But my team here in Metis were absolutely phenomenal. And I do think, and it's this is really important, and, and anybody who saw the text messages that flew between us late last night would not believe this for a second, right? But I <laughs> also had you guys to lean on and to say, guys, struggling a little bit. And, and we talked it through. And, you know, part of us talking it through as well was that... that um, each one of you, I think, basically said, yeah, there was a time when I was struggling and, you know, blah, blah, blah and this is what I did. And and making sure that um, Andy used to send me texts at ridiculous hours of the days, day and evening to say, remember, do this, remember, do that, you know. And, and you know, sometimes you're really going, oh, Jesus Christ. But, but <laughs> do you know what? Brilliant, brilliant reminders. No, and they were, they were so well meant. And I knew yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a bunch of people in my corner here who are saying, you are doing the right thing and, and, and drive on. So... Look, one year on from having to take t- two weeks out, and here we go back to the smallest file in the world, right? And first world problems and all that. But so important because you can only do your best work with your clients if you are in a good place. And like I'm in at the moment, it's really, really busy, but I'm just loving it and I'm feeling like I'm having an impact. And, you know, that's where I want to remain. But I can only do that if I remind myself to look after myself. So, um, Alan, I, I, I pass over to you because I think the advisor under management is, is is such a great phrase, and you know, remind ourselves to look after ourselves. Yeah, and that's that's true. And and you've all said a version of this because we are deeply entwined, often in our uh, not maybe every client, but a lot of our clients' lives. And you you do play the role of you know when we're not life coaches, we're not therapists. But if you if you're serious about this, you know, you give a shit and you care. And, and this is where you should have come in, Nick. But I'll, I will share a, just a, a brief experience that I had f- a few years ago um, with this. We took on a new client. You, and you'll all have clients like this, um, just a lovely couple that you know that came to us that were just getting into retirement. And you know, not every one of your clients are your best friends. But these are ones that I thought I, I would know them socially. You know, I, I could hang out with them. I could go for a drink or go for dinner with them. They were kind of my sort of people. But bit cheeky a bit irreverent but you know the family focused they had um grown-up children 
just had their first grandchild, lived in London, sold his business, retired down to Devon and were just planning, you know, the next, they were just early 60s, planning the next several decades of their lives. And we, as I say, we hit it off like the proverbial house on fire. We did all the modeling, all the planning, worked out how much they needed. And, and, you know, they were just just mapping out the next several decades of their life. They loved skiing. They were going to go to Canada. They had this sort of bucket list things that we're going to do. And you kind of know where this is headed because everything was wonderful. And I I got a phone call out of the blue. This is a, you know, a year later after we did all the work, everything was implemented, everything was up and running. And I get a phone call from this guy, um, let's call him Stephen. And he just goes, Alan, um, I, I'm going to cut straight to the chase. He said, I've been diagnosed with cancer. I'd be given less than, less than a year to live. And I just, honestly, it just hit me. You know, these are things that, that happen, but I just, I was really shocked by it. I was taken aback by it. And particularly because I was deeply involved in the, the initial planning work and really in a quite a granular level, working out what they were going to do this year, five years now, 10 years from now. And he says, yeah, I've got less than a year to live. So look, can we meet up? We've got some stuff to do. And whoa. So my colleague Charles and I, we traveled down to, to Devon and we spent, we spent a couple of days. We booked a hotel. We spent the whole day with them. And honestly, their house, they sort of, they bought this home, their forever home to retire to. Um, I don't know if any of you, know, you guys know Solcombe beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And it was just overlooking the beach. And it was just amazing, an amazing home. You can imagine sitting in that room. You've all done versions of this, going through it, just working out what life was going to be like after he passed. You know, it was brutal. Really, really, you know, the, the, the tears were never far from your eyes. And I'm, you know, on the one hand, I'm thinking, well, I'm just a you know, financial planner, just trying to do the, the, right, the right work here. But it was intensely human. And we stayed the night. We all went out for dinner that evening. And it was, you know, it, it, there's some, it's ridiculous, really, because we had a laugh. We were laughing. We, we almost forgot what was going on at the time. You know, a few bottles of wine were shared. Good, you know, and he, he used to, you know, take the mick out of me, all sorts of um, little sort of jokes that he would, um, he would have at my expense and at Charles's expense. And it was, um, anyway, we just had a good, good fun evening. Next day, drives us back to the train station, gives me a hug, which I don't do with every client, certainly every male client. <laughs> And looks me in the eye and he said, you know, thank God you're here looking after us for this difficult time. Go home. Life goes on. Keep in touch with them. Then I get a call from um, his his wife to say, you know, only a few months later that he's gone. He's passed. He's gone. And I was just, and that, so that particular example, and we've, as I say, we've, all, we've got versions of them. There's other situations I've been involved in as, as well. But that one really hit me hard. I took it kind of, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Honestly, for weeks and weeks, I still think about it now. This was a couple of years ago, this all happened. I still think about it now. And we do take on, sometimes we've got this kind of mental gymnastics to go through. And again, it's it's more sort of small violins, but this was, this can hit you very profoundly when you, you know, the, the, the other side of the coin, when you get in the positive is you get close to a family, you understand what they're doing, what they're trying to achieve with their life. And the downside is when things don't go according to plan, you really feel it. You feel it in a, in, a, in a hard way. So, again, these are – this is a sort of the ups and downs of the work that we do. I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it, but it can impact you, and it can. You know, it, it, as, as I say, it sort of knocked me sideways for quite a while. Mm-hmm. I would wake up in the morning thinking about it, thinking about the, all the unfulfilled ambition that family will never now have because of, you know, a cruel twist of fate in life. Wow, that's powerful. That's proper power. I'm glad I didn't play the uh, story time jingle at the right time because that, that would uh, I didn't want to. That would have undermined perhaps the the portent of that story. That's mm. that's uh, that's that's wow. Okay, um, guys, Carl, unless you've got something to add, my friend, we are now 44 minutes into this show. Where the time goes, I do not know. Um, I'm happy to draw a line under the meat and potatoes. Yeah, look, I, if, if, look, I, probably a very serious topic, right? Um, and a little bit unlike some of the other topics we've covered here, but it, it is really, really important. And tomorrow is Valentine's Day. We're recording this a few days before it goes out, and it's the Widger triplets, Robbie, Rachel, and Chloe, are 16 tomorrow. Wow. Wow. I'm taking the day off. Good, good man. <laughs> I wish I took all of their other birthdays off. I ah. didn't, but tomorrow I am going to, and uh, we're going to have a great day. That's fantastic. So, yeah, have, look after yourself first and the Has ones it- that you love. As yeah, ever. that's 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 well said, Carl. That that is it. We do have a lot of Mickey taking on this program, but that's that's profound and it's true. Look after yourself. Look after your loved ones, and of course, then look after your your colleagues and your clients. 
Good stuff. Now, can we get back to taking, taking the piss out of each other? Yeah, I was saying, that certainly was profound for Carl. Um, very good. <laughs> but, but, however, Tempus is fugiting, and this is normally, for those listening to this and not watching, this is where Carl makes a hand signal that suggests I'm self-pleasuring when I use the word Tempus fugiting. We'll move on from that. Um, I think, if I look at my nest, oh, there she is. Post has arrived at my front door. She's got her hands on our bulging sack bulging of sack. questions. As you can hear, the Trappists have been stirring, and they've been knocking them out. And if you want to knock one out for us as well, then go to the link in the pinned tweet at Advisor Podcast, or even easier, go to the exact same link in the social show notes. You click on there, you put your name, your question, you hit submit. If you do it that way, we will get round to your question. We're going through them chronologically at the moment. Um, we've got so many to get through. But please consider doing that. That'll be absolutely great. And the three questions. Well, actually, I can see three questions that, perched on the, that, on the edge of my That's possibly sack. the most inappropriate segue of all time ever. But well, anyway. I don't, I don't like this stuff. I don't know what's, what's it's, it's, your, it's your mind. But let me continue because it doesn't, doesn't get any better because perched at the top of our bulging sack are three questions. We need to roll up our shirt sleeves, gents, and pull them off. Now, who's first on this? Let's open up the, this letter. This is from a Michael Gilmore, who's on Twitter as at Right Gilmore. This is a really good question. And Carl, you're going to have a stab at this first, and then we'll see how we go around the group. Is there a defined path for second careerists to join the profession whilst using their extens- their existing skill set relevant experience without going back to square one from an earnings perspective? Yeah, okay. Um, if, if so, we'd love to hear more about it. And if not, what advice would the trap pack give to someone in that situation? Wow. Uh, yeah, fantastic wow. question. Um, I, the reason I offered to kind of st- give a stab at an answer here is have a client at the moment who's in the process of selling his business. He's, uh, he'll be 60 this year. And he said to me, do you know what, Carl? I, I, I'd really, really love to do what you do. Is there any way that that can happen? Um, the fast answer, unfortunately, is no, right? Because you need to get the qualifications um, and then you need a number of years experience before you can actually give the financial advice. Now, where he may well um, have tons of experiences giving all of the life advice and the life experience and all that other stuff that we maybe spoke about earlier on. So um, I don't know the, the, how you do the qualifications over there, but the, the very basic qualifications here, the qualified financial advisor, probably take you a year to get those um, and, and then you're kind of getting settled in. But at, at 60, you know, he's kind of, I want, just want to hit the ground running. So he was saying, what about if I just kind of um, grabbed a load of people and brought them into you? And, and maybe there's something in that. I, I, I don't know. But um, because it will be his own peers who he really, really, really values the work that we have done for him. And he's like, you know, most of them now are with private banks and stockbrokers and all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, what you guys do is totally different. And and he's always telling me that we're useless at telling people exactly what we do. <laughs> so we have a we have a marketing dilemma there. But um, yeah, I, I there, there's probably no clear cut answer, and probably not the answer that that the the, the guy who posed the question wants. Um, okay, that'd be my take on it. I I, I do like it though. I do. Okay, I do, Andy do like and then the idea. Andy and Alan. Um, the apprenticeship stage in this business is quite long. Long story short, I say it's a decade long. You can short circuit it. Someone who's, let's say, 45, somewhat experienced, somewhat financially stable could probably short circuit that 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 period. But yeah, it is a combination of learning new skills, doing exams uh, and building up a client bank. In terms of earnings, I think your earnings will go down to zero when you enter this profession. Um, it just then depends on how quickly you're going to build it up. You know, uh, you know, they're the facts at the end of the day. I mean, obviously, you could get a job somewhere that would uh, give you a, some level of you know financial income coming in. So, um, yeah, but the, the the apprenticeship stage I think is about about a decade long. You can short circuit it and uh, do it a little bit quicker. But I think from 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 zero to knowing what you're doing in a client meeting, I think probably the fastest you could do that is probably five years, and that's really really going for it. So. That's the reality of it. Like, like all great things, why should it be easy? You know, if you want to become black belt in karate, grade eight piano, you know, there's no short, short shortcuts. Over to you, Alan. Uh, I had somebody approach me last year on the same subject, and it is quite interesting. I suppose it's, is it an upside or a downside? This whole sector has become more professional, hasn't it? You, if, you, if you were to ask the question 10, 15 years ago, you say, fine, you know, get your basic level qualifications, yeah. off, off you go. 
Um, yeah. And it, I guess it depends on the structure of any, you know, you, I, there'll be people who will offer you a self-employed contract. If you can flog stuff, something, if you can sell products for fees, commissions, and you've got a ready-made network of people that you could sell to, you know, off you go. The challenge is for the better firms, they have become far more professional and there is a much more of a kind of, um, as you say, Andy, an apprenticeship and it does take time. It's a bit like saying, you know, at the age of 60, I think I'll be a lawyer. Well, you can, but you've got to qualify as a lawyer, start right back from the day one and it ain't going to happen overnight. But you can do it if you're absolutely passionate and dedicated about it, but you will have to, there absolutely will be a period of, if these people have been used to, you know, having some reasonable earnings, there's no way they're going to be maintaining the same level of earnings for a period of, of, of time. I think there are this sort of two or three component parts. One is the, the technical bit, which I think is relatively straightforward. You've got to even get qualified to a you know basic level, which, as you say, it might be probably about similar in this country, about 12 months. Um, the other is the, is the human aspect of it. And I think uh, you know mature people, mature professionals are likely to be pretty good at that. Yep. They've just got life skills. They've, they've been, you know, they've had the they've had kids they've done all the things that people can relate to but the other part of, of um, this sort of three-pronged triangle is the opportunity to sit in front of people where are the where are your clients coming from and uh, if you can satisfy two out of three of those you've got a chance uh, three out of three even better but it will take it will take time although i can see this becoming more um more popular as, as the profession evolves and it becomes quite an aspirational profession to get into I think there'll be more people asking the same question as time goes on. So there'll be more opportunities, I think, in future. But yeah, good question. Yeah, really, really good question. My quick take on this is if you if you need earnings from day one, maybe come into the profession as some kind of trainee power planner where you're going to be an employee. And while you're doing that, you're learning about the jargon of our profession. You can do the exams as well. And then maybe migrate to advising. But you you won't go from a standing start to earning, you just can't do it because of the, quite rightly, the regulatory burdens. 30 years ago, you could join one of the old sales forces, the Allied Dunbars, the Imperial Life. And you, I, I imagine once you've been through their internal training program, which is probably three pints of lager down the pub and how to write the back of an envelope, you'd be out flogging your mix and everything else. Well, those days are thankfully behind us now. It is, it is far more structured. And there is a, and Andy said 10 years. Alan mentioned the human side of it. It's the human side that's what we're, that's why we're on this planet, and that's the bit that will take you 10 years to learn the nuances of. Okay, uh, let's open up the next uh, letter. Who's this one from? Matthew Tumbridge on Twitter as at Matt underscore Tumbers. Plumbing question. You don't like bonds. Got it. And he said in a recent pod that his tilts are value funds. What are the tilts the rest of you use for, for, for performance, and what, if anything... Do you use to dampen volatility when you have to? And you start with that, and then I'll follow, and then the other two guys can chip in if they want to. Well, I mean, he's he's, he's opened the question with we don't like bonds. No, we, we just know the role of bonds. I, I wouldn't say we like them or don't like them. You know, we we know their role. I suppose it's a relatively minor point. Yeah, so I've um, been through the dimensional Vanguard sort of school of investing, um, index fund, asset class investing. My tilts are small companies over large, value companies over growth, emerging markets over developed markets. But still about 50% of my investment portfolios are large US developed markets. But yeah, so I, I, I have uh, in my 100% Maven Invest 100 portfolio, there's a, there, there, there's a leaning towards emerging markets, small and value companies. Okay. Yes, uh, and likewise. And uh, this is not advice, of course. We're talking here to advisors, but I, you know, the 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 the, uh, sort of the essence of what I believe is encapsulated in one fund, really, which is the dimensional global targeted value, which is ultra small gap and ultra value, and and take make of that what you will. Matt, your point about dampening volatility. We don't want to dampen volatility. That's the last thing we want to do is dampen volatility because volatility works both ways, and most three quarters of the time the volatility is up. So why would you want to dampen that? If you dampen the downside. If you if you mitigate against the temporary declines, you are giving up some of the permanent advance, and that is a big no no. We have to embrace volatility ourselves as advisors, internalize that, and then find ways of communicating this arcane countercultural message to our clients. That's our role. Savers want volatility. Even people entering a typical three decade retirement want volatility because if you can ride it out, that's where you're going to get the superior returns to ward off the pernicious evil that is inflation. Alan or Carl, anything to add? Not really. I mean, it's just around the edges. We have a um, small allocation to uh, global property, a form of 
REITs, which is seen as something of a diversifier. Um, there is some um, lack of correlation between sort of traditional equities, but all these things are just right around the edges. You've you just you've summed it up well. Um, yeah, nothing else to say. Okay, Carl, anything to add? Look, I've mentioned it before. We use the dimensional world allocation yeah. funds, so that's no point in me going back over old old stuff. Okay, great stuff. And I think we have one more question that I can open up. This is from Dan Raggett, who's on LinkedIn. Daniel Raggett, Raggett with two Gs and two Ts. In episode four, Andy said that he wasn't chartered. As a newly CII qualified financial planner, could you elaborate on what you think the issues are with the charter qualification? Do you think certified is better? What are the pros and cons of each route? Thanks, guys. Really enjoying the podcast so far. Okay, Andy, you can, you can run with this, but we have answered this a few times before, so just give us your bang answer. I said I was proudly non-chartered. I, I, I feel like some people just hide behind the exams, basically. I, I think there's other sort of skills you've got to learn in this profession that I think are a bit more important than exams. I think I'm two exams away from being chartered, and I've per- purposely taken my foot off the gas and, and not done those exams. Uh, and I work with chartered advisors and certified advisors, and a lot of them are not very good at financial planning. Um, but yeah, that's by the by. Over to you, Alan. Chartered, chartered Alan Smith. It's again, is he chartered? It's, it's, it's a bit of a moot point, though, isn't it? I mean, you, you, all things being equal, look. It, you, to me, it's a it's a hygiene factor. You should be qualified to the level of expectation in your profession if i would i know and i completely know what you're saying there are people with all the qualifications up the yin yang there are hopeless that can't do financial plan can't do half this stuff but they've got the badges um so that doesn't but i'm going to assume that if i was going if i was hiring um, a surgeon for an operation i would rather he was qualified to the highest level of qualifications and he had you know human the human touch and all the rest of it i just i'd, I'd rather that than somebody who had base level you know a, a an O level in biology, but was <laughs> had really good sort of bedside manner. So to me, it's just a hygiene factor. The so you should be everyone in this profession should be qualified to level six, which is chartered. I've lo- kind of lost track of it because we gave up all our my colleagues were CFP as well certified, but you have to keep out your would you call it you know your ongoing CPD and everything else for more than one uh, organization, and we just chucked it after a bit but i think that's all changing soon uh, and with the all the sort of shenanigans going on with the cii i'm not sure how that's going to play out the the certified one that's obviously that's the u.s so initially came out of the u.s certified financial planner cfp which is all about can you know can you do real financial planning um and so the and they're all kind of merging together now. I don't think one is better than, than the other of the two qualifications. I think if you're really going after it, especially if you were young, if I was if I was in my twenties, I'd try to get both these qualifications, twenties and thirties, get them both, get them out of the way, get them done, then get on with delivering, you know, world class, real financial planning to, to your clients. There's no there's, one is not better than the other. They're just different. Um, if I could just make a comment, it's funny. Andy threw that comment out. I don't know way back, and it seems to be keep, keep, keep bouncing going back. back. The thing is, because the, right? the whole the industry has, keeps on telling, particularly young people in the profession, get yeah, qualified, but, get your exams, get your exams. And, and mean, Hart did one throwaway comment for six I episodes mean, ago, intent, and he keeps getting pulled up about it. It's intentionally provocative. Obviously, exams are very important, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but if we listen to ourselves, <laughs> right, no, no client is ever going to give a shit about the conversation we've just had, right? Um, <laughs> and again, it's it sounds yeah, like... Yeah, but Carl, your client, your client assumes you're qualified. Yeah. I don't go to the doctor and say, can I see your badges? Can I see your qualifications before we sit down? And you know, yeah. I don't go to any... I don't go to see, hire a lawyer and say, show me your, your legal qualifications. There's an assumption yes. made. And I, yeah, I just think you should... Yeah. To be regulated, to be a regulated firm, I'm sure you have to have some level of qualification, sure. right? Yeah, but so there's, a, there's a minimum this, level. There's a minimum just to squeeze across the line. And then there's a, yeah. I want to take it to the next level, which yeah. is I'm, I'm taking I, this job I, prof- seriously. I'm a professional. And so I want to I be above the minimum saying, entry level. If, you're, if I was advising my kids to, and they were in the UK, it sounds like you're in total turmoil, I repeat. <laughs> but if they were in the UK, um, I would get them to do all of the qualifications. Absolute shambles. But it, it is, it is, it's just a joke shop. Like, you know, you, you guys don't seem to be clear on it yourselves. So I, I don't know. Um, seems like a moot point. I think they... I shouldn't, I, have I, even, I, I, I shouldn't have even interjected on this point. I'm sorry. I'm, I will mute my mic now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they'll make it a requirement for us to be level six. That, again, will mean... 
more the, financial the, the, advisors they can't leaving in the profession. Any time soon. They, they okay. can't okay. decimate the numbers. Yeah, we, we might lose, I don't know, 30, 40% of advisors if that was the case. So, yeah, more than I, I think that was good, good enough. Maybe they want that. Who knows? Okay, we've given those uh, those questions down with thrashing. So thank you, Trappist, for sending them in. Keep on sending them in in the routes outlined earlier on. I think it's time we moved on to what many people call the culture corner. <laughs> wow. Right, we've all four of us have got a contribution. I'm going to start from the bottom up. Uh, let's start with Mr. Smith, the John Dashfield Power Questions. Yes, yeah, just something that... Uh, I saw this. This was a, a few months ago. John, very kindly. I don't know if anyone has um, met or dealt with a guy called John Dashfield. John is a. I've I got the question ex- deck. I've got the deck. Yeah, an ex financial planner. Yeah. yeah, that's it. And um, he does a lot of advising, coaching, and consulting. And actually, interesting card, just linking a few of these things together for those you know, who deals with financial planners and and will you know do a lot of kind of quite personal work in terms of the you know the personal coaching for advisors who in turn are giving advice to their clients. So written quite a good book worth reading as well but john dashfield he's relatively recently and i know you guys have got I don't know if you've seen these carl but he's, he's created a set of what he calls financial planning power questions so they're like playing cards and so there's however many of them there is but within this pack of cards there are some fabulous questions and if you wanted to learn how to really get in and become better at you know being a real financial planner when well obviously asking great questions and then going deeper and listening to the answer and then responding to that that's how you go that's one of the ways you're going to become a better financial planner so those are available clientcenteredadvisors.com yeah clientcenteredadvisors.com we'll put a link in the show notes worth checking out a lot of john's work his writing his blogs his book and these cards that's my contribution Excellent stuff, thank you. And uh, I like John Dashwood is very down to earth. He's, he's there's no airs and graces, he's, uh, which is which is refreshing. Carl, you've you've got a you you you've got the uh, podcast you'd like to talk about featuring the uh, future World Cup winner Maro Otoji. Tell us tell us about that, Carl. <laughs> he may well be. Yeah, I, I've mentioned this podcast before, and I just love it. And it's because it's relevant because the Six Nations is on at the moment. The high performance podcast and the the. It's actually not the latest version. It's kind of two episodes ago, they interview Maro Itoji. And uh, I just thought it was a brilliant um, interview because he comes across as a very kind of <laughs> a humble, kind of a shy kind of a dude who's got, who, but, but at the same time, huge clarity of thought, um, knows what his values are and knows what he's about. And that's like the total opposite to the player that we see screaming and roaring in the second row playing for England. He's also a wonderful player. Like he really is, absolutely top top quality. Um, but it was interesting because I was listening to it with um, with my young fella. And like Mario Toji was playing, was brought into the senior training squad in Saracens when he was sixteen years of age. So this boy was, you know, they, they had him marked out from a very very early on. But the, the high performance podcast in general, I've mentioned it before. It's, good, yeah. it's absolutely fantastic. But I really loved that. Um, that episode and uh, you know it's just the, the public perception of someone and the actual individual can be so different so yeah really enjoyed that it's a bit like yeah. Lincoln great <laughs> it's, it's, it's not but, at all like, both, both, both the perception and the real Nick Lincoln are unpleasant is what you yeah. 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 although his you tweets are a, are, a, are a little bit worse than, than yeah. the person when you're talking it, about Nick Lincoln Mr. Hart it's OJ. Mr. Hart you've, you've got a book to talk about it's, o, it's OJ is uh, from my neck of the woods we both went to school in Harrow I'll move on from that uh, Andy, <laughs> I have a yay. He, is he not Nigerian? Andy, Went to school with Maro Andy. Andy. No, he really didn't. Andy, Andy. Harrow is massive. Is You've never <laughs> crossed the path. Never crossed path with Maro Atoji. You were saying, Andy. I'm pretty sure Maria Tojo went to Harrow School. Obviously, I didn't go to Harrow School, but yeah, it's very close to my 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 my. Uh, yeah, no, anyway, he went to a comp. He went to a comp, I think. He went to a comp. He went to Harrow School. Ah, oh, I might have got okay. it wrong. Okay, move on. Uh, so, my book recommendation is a path through the jungle. Uh, it's on Audible, and it's free <laughs> if you've got an Audible subscription. It's called A Path Through the Jungle, a psychological health and well-being program to develop robustness and resilience. So it's sort of on topic today. It's the guy who wrote The Chimp Paradox, uh, Professor Steve Peters. He's a very sort of um, 
accessible chap um, and it's narrated by him uh, it's worth listening to if you've got an audible subscription it's free to download i'm sort of three chapters into it it's pretty decent that's my recommendation for this fortnight over to you thank you Nick. andrew i, I in, in the in in our in our agenda for this show and believe it or not dear trappist we do have something that resembles an agenda you'd put a path through the jungle book and i, I thought you were going to talk about the disney film from 1967 <laughs> Um, sadly, I know, and I'm sure the recommendation is King of the Swingers. Good, king, oh, I'm the King of the Swingers, man, a jungle VIP. I've reached the top. All that. Brilliant. Actually, it's my favorite Disney film. By the way, um, he so told you he did go to, he got a scholarship to Harrow School. There you go. Uh, he can't trust vibe. what you read. Um, so, and I've got one as well, just quickly. Uh, so, Modern Wisdom is one of these podcasts that, that, that uh, I think it's Chris Williams does them. He's very prodigious podcaster he has loads of episodes and i kind of dip in and out depending on who the guest is but the most recent episode i think it was if it's not the most recent it's, it's two back episode 190 rory sutherland who we all just like you know you just stick rory in front of a microphone you ask him one question and then 70 minutes later you just hit the stop recording <laughs> button um and he's just off extemporizing all kinds of stuff so he's got this thing about japanese toilets which is definitely um stairless thing, but that's that's that's, that's that's good fun and that's stair lifts, stair lifts. And Roy has been at Humans Under Management. I think he came in as the second ranked speaker after, yeah. Nick Lincoln. Nick? Uh, he was the top <laughs> if, of course. If, 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 you want, if you want to laugh, listen to Andy Hart interviewing the famous Rory. Because yeah, that's exactly what he does. Ask him one question. He keeps on trying to interrupt. Uh, yeah, another question. <laughs> Rory just carries I mean, on. This steamrollers across his host an hour so, and a half later. So- Thank you. Good night. So when he spoke at Humans Under Management, he was the final speaker of the keynote of the day. So he was on at, let's say, 4.30. He yeah. arrived about qu- quarter past four. So I'm frantically trying to find him. And he's, 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 he's at the front of the auditorium. I go up to him. And he's, he's literally going on stage in five minutes' time. He said, Andy, just so I'm clear, is it a keynote speech uh, or are we doing a fireside chat? This is five minutes before going on. I said, no, no, it's a keynote. It's, it's you for 45 minutes. He's like, okay, fine, 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 fine. And he just goes up there and just rocks it. So, yeah, um, very much <laughs> oh, off the cuff. That's, but- that's, that, that- that is a Classic that is a Rory. skill set. That is a real skill set. Okay, gentlemen, we're at sixty-seven minutes somehow. We haven't killed each other. The tech has not collapsed, <laughs> for which I'm eternally grateful. I've got through this show with an awful head cold, so I do. If, if I sound more nasally and adenoidal than normal, I do apologise, dear Trappist. You know what to do, right? Like and subscribe on YouTube. Tell three of your peers about us, please. Give us a six out of five star review on iTunes. It all helps us. If it helps us, it's going to help you. This is a this is one of those circles that goes round and round and round and just gets better and better. I don't know what this is. It was nowhere. I'm, where am I going? I'm going to a complete yeah. black hole. Let's end it there, guys. Uh, I think it's time to wrap up. And we will see each other in two weeks' time in the studio of Doom. Until then, take care out there, guys. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.